to Somerville Livewire. I'm Mary Lemire. Imagine that you live in a densely populated city. Everything that is, is within walking distance. So you don't have a car. Their nearest grocery store is 10 minutes away. Fantastic. But imagine now that you're a young parent, you've got a couple of kids in tow, and imagine even further, it might be raining, you're carrying groceries, and between you and the grocery store is a highway where cars regularly go 40 to 50 miles an hour. And there is a walk light, but it doesn't stay um, in your direction quite long enough for you to get across the highway carrying the groceries and dragging your kids along. And what if it's starting to get dark and it's um, a little bit slippery? Should be easy, but it's not. And imagine then you're in a car and you're going up that highway and at the last second you see this parent with the kids trying to get across the street. It's a scary situation all around. And it's so bad they started calling it the corridor of death. It's McGrath Highway between Broadway and Route 38. Now, some Williams who've been there forever, you know all about this, but a lot of people who just moved to the city may not be fully aware of this terrible situation. So the good news is that there's a plan to make it safe. The money's been allocated and construction was scheduled to begin. And the bad news is that we just found out literally within the last few days that they put it on the back burner and they decided to work on a viaduct project for Route 93. And not only that, but they're gonna be routing traffic through Somerville, through this general area, which is gonna make it even worse. So to discuss this issue, we're thrilled to be joined by Wig Zamor and Aira Schur. Wig is a longtime Somerville resident and grassroots activist focused on the intersection and interaction of land use, transportation, environment, and health. And among other things too numerous to mention, he's also the founder of the Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership, otherwise known as STEP, and the Community Assessment of Freeway Exposures and Health, um, C-A-F-E-H. Wig, thank you for joining us. Well, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Good. And Aira has lived in Somerville since 2004, so some would call her a newbie, but that's a, a fair amount of time to be living in the city. She first got involved in safe streets issues after getting hit by motorists twice in one week on her daily bicycle commute from Somerville to downtown Boston. She's a founding member of Somerville Bicycle Safety and part of the steering committee of the Somerville Alliance for Safe Streets and um, a group of residents representing various backgrounds and perspectives who came together to advocate for safe streets and equitable mobility across Somerville. Aira, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Mary Ellen. It's great to be here to talk about this critical issue. So you've um, gotten up close and personal to this issue. Tell us what it was like getting hit on your commute. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anybody who rides a bike around our city streets or walks around our city streets or tries to navigate uh, using a wheelchair, another mobility device, or as you mentioned, pushing a stroller, who probably hasn't had similar, uh, at least close calls. Uh, throughout Somerville, we have a lot of cut through car traffic. We have a lot of speeding and a lot of, um, you know, stoplight blowing. And Mystic and McGrath are just, uh, you know, that common street times a thousand, times a million. Uh, those are, as you said in your introduction, those are highways running through our neighborhoods and connecting, bisecting some of our most important destinations, grocery stores, open space, large housing projects. And it's unconscionable that people have to navigate those on foot um, and on bicycle and with wheelchairs as they are today. So, um, Wig, could you tell us, you've been at this for a long time. So is this the first time that Somerville has had to struggle with a transportation issue? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, transportation issues are handled regionally uh, in general, and then at the state level for large funding. So we're part of, uh, the Boston uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is Boston plus a hundred other cities and towns which surround it. And to get um, 
projects on state or federal roads and rights of way, rail, um, financed and accomplished, uh, you need to be in uh, long range plans if they're big and you need to be in shorter range plans, whether they're big or small. And that's by uh, regional decision. So tell us a little bit about the history of all the actions that have taken place, you know, begin, beginning with, you know, 93 and, you know, the, the initial construction sure. of these highways. Yeah. Um, in the 70s, in the very early 70s, around the time of the Clean Air Act, when, when we had two national parties that were working together on things like environment and health, um, there was a fair amount of um, reconsideration of surface transportation policy. And we were coming out of World War II. Um, there was a press from uh, General and then President Eisenhower to build out the interstate highway system, in part because of its concern for logistical moves, um, both for the domestic economy and, the, and in the case of defense needs. And at the same time, there was a return to a civilian economy and people thinking about quality of life and um, maybe more attention on the middle class after World War II and, and the depression were over. And there was also a growing level of domestic pollution at the same time. So Somerville um, being right along uh, the um, Mystic River, um, is in one of the major historic corridors for, for Eastern Massachusetts. You know, it was a river corridor, it was a rail corridor, it was a canal corridor, and it's somewhat of a natural roadway corridor because of, of its geographic location. At the same time, there was a, a big stop put on um, highway building, um, about 1970 and about the time I-93 through Somerville was being considered, there was a concern that there was too much growth in traffic and too much growth in air pollution, and that maybe we should be focused a little bit more on public transit. And that caused a couple years of debate and discussion. And a quite progressive uh, plan came out of that that resulted in the red and orange lines being effectively built or rebuilt completely. Um, but those assets uh, were largely placed in Boston and Cambridge. And there was a desire still to complete um, I-93 um, for regional highway efficiency sake to Boston. And Somerville, um, came up kind of on the short end of the stick. There was a local debate. Uh, some people thought, well, if we get a giant interstate here, it will help our local economy. That turns out to be wildly untrue. Um, the, the biggest interstates tend to just serve the very largest portions of the economy and not the local, the local neighborhoods along the way. So that was not correct. And then there were others, including the Cassesso family in States Avenues in, in uh, East Somerville, who thought it was a horrible idea. At the same time, and, and I'll wrap up here because I don't want to go on too long. Um, the Cleaner Act um, had passed in 1970, the first really, really huge environmental effort on the air side uh, to get a handle on, on pollution and, and to mitigate it and to manage it. And I-93 clearly uh, would, have, would have had to and did proceed in violation of that Clean Air Act. So what happened here was that there, there wasn't enough of a clear opinion among the community. And they went ahead with the highway, notwithstanding the known impacts. And the environmental studies done for I-93 were quite good. They showed huge increases in lead, uh, which were at that point a known neurotoxicant, basically take away children's ability to think or to emote relationally for the rest of their life. Um, 
And there was an awareness of noise levels and there was an awareness of particulate matter from the roadways. And so, uh, we and, got those. And they went ahead anyway. And yes. But you're talking about, so this construction presumably was early 70s, right? Yes. So they made the decision in 70. So Somerville has had this added pollution in the environment since then, correct? Yeah, you're talking probably five to 10,000 deaths from right. that pollution. Just from that pollution alone in um, yep. over all of these years. So why do you think that um, they went ahead and did it even though they knew the environmental impact in Somerville? I mean, is that because Somerville just didn't have the clout? Um, you, you know, you mentioned that there was disagreement within the community. Um, you know, what do you think those reasons? Yeah, I, I think um, it wasn't clear cut enough um, that all of Somerville was against that project and they weren't. Um, so that was one issue. And the se a second issue was that uh, the regulatory structures were just getting up and running. One, one of the tough parts about the Clean Air Act is that the scientists and economists knew that it would be cost effective to put really stringent air pollution controls on the big industries and the big smokestacks, but they were less certain about the economics of trying to uh, control pollution from tailpikes and from, from cars and trucks and, and other mobile sources. That, that clarity, uh, in, in that lack of, of clarity caused the Clean Air Act to be split into two parts. And they went ahead with the industrial and manufacturing and energy controls while they held off a little bit on the mobile controls. And, and then uh, what, what eventually happened was that a small engineering group in Northern New Jersey, Mooney, came up with a three-way catalytic converter that solved three um, tricky pollution issues from the tailpipe um, that at first glance were opposing each other in solution. Uh, but with the confidence of the engineering and science community and the efforts of a lot of entrepreneurs, both in universities and in small companies, uh, they came up with a solution. And remarkably, General Motors then asked that the conversion to catalytic converters be accelerated. You know, we're, so, we're used so, to is, hearing yeah, about which, delays, but they did the opposite. They said, you know what, if we're gonna clean things up, let's just decide to do that and mandate it and go faster. Right, so, so you know, and that's, that's obviously a plus, but nevertheless, the particulate matter within that community is there. I mean, not even talking about the fact that when you run a highway through a city, you know, you are displacing people and broke up those communities. And now we have, you know, this huge highway between people and their grocery store or, um, you know, families and homeowners. And then plus it's noisy in those locations. And as you, as you undoubtedly know, you know, if you've got a triple decker, those, um, you know, the people who are living there are literally at grade with the highway and have to listen to the noise yeah. and, and so the, all of that pollution. Th and there are this three... isn't just 93, you know, 93 is an elevated highway, but the way that the roads underneath were rebuilt were built as surface level, essentially highways. So Route 28, Route 38, otherwise right. known as Mystic Avenue, McGra you know, these are highway type designs, which are really city streets. That yeah, that, that's correct. And, and they used to be more integrated with the community and, and more at surface and less, less elevated, including McGrath, which has elevated sessions sections, but, but I would say there have been three real quandaries um, about mobile pollution, notwithstanding the regulations. And what has happened is that the environmental health community did a super job understanding regional fine particles. And, and notably, um, the Harvard Six Cities study published in 93 showed um, a much higher level of cardiovascular death from, from regional fine particles than was anticipated. People presumed, um, uh, leaning on common sense, that, that, that health effects would be driven by pulmonary, but that's not true. Mo most of the health effects are cardiovascular. 
and almost every chronic disease is affected by by particulate matter. Um, and speaking, look at the COVID map. Which, yeah, and yeah. I was just yeah. Go ahead and talk about that era. So and, the impacts and, and, of and COVID in our community are a direct match with the overlay on other health impacts from these particulates, and you know it's the same story over and over again. Sorry, Wei, go ahead. Oh no, no, that's <laughs> okay because I'm going on a little long, and we got to get you in here. Um, what what the quandary the the quandary has been the last decade, following um, the really strong EPA um, regulations put into place following 1993 um, on fine particles, is that it's really easy to study fine particles. You can put a monitor in the middle of a community, and it will serve to give you the exposure of everybody in a five to ten square mile community. But with ultrafine particles from, from sources like highways or jets, um, those have very steep gradients and they are completely unregulated. And they have much steeper gradients, not just in, in uh, their presence in the air, but much deeper gradients in exposure. And, and even worse, they have much steep, steeper gradients in health outcomes much so higher that, high right. mortality risk if you're next to a highway from cardiovascular than if you're in a polluted region. And they're yeah. much harder to study. Yeah, so, and, and that's all incredible background. And um, we, you know, and, and that's the crisis that we're in right now within Somerville. So going back to the safety issues in terms of traffic and on the street era, could you talk about, I mean, we've had deaths, we've had injuries. Talk a little bit about that. Sure, absolutely. Um, so Somerville is a vision zero community, which means that our mayor has committed to end uh, deaths and serious injuries from automobiles. Uh, if you look at the map of vision zero uh, accidents, so you know car crashes, uh, serious injuries, death, these, there's a direct overlay, just like COVID, just like all of the other diseases with these two areas. So these are the, this is the most dangerous intersection for street safety in Somerville. And um, SAS got involved. So there have been three fatalities. So three pedestrians killed by motorists on Mystic and McGrath in under two years in our city. And the last one happened in April, a 72 year old man was crossing the street with his groceries and was hit by a motorist, it was a hit and run. He died several weeks later. And uh, the Somerville Lines for Safe Streets just said, listen, we've, we've been together for six months. We've been focused on advocating for the city to make changes on the city streets, but this is much bigger. And you know, this is a MassDOT controlled intersection. These roads are MassDOT controlled. We need to get involved in the adv advocacy and then connecting with STEP and with WIG and with our state delegation who have been fighting for air and um, pollution and sound control measures on 993. It was just a, a complete overlap of injustice and MassDOT ignoring both the immediate safety issues as well as the long-term pollution and health issues. So you talk about MassDOT, the Department of Transportation. So to what extent, I mean, does Somerville control these? I mean, talk, you know, I mean, why is it, what are the barriers to this? How much control does Somerville actually have? And who do we have to go through in order to make these changes? Yeah, both both Mystic and McGrath are uh, state controlled. So the Massachusetts Department of Transportation and some of the sidewalks are controlled by uh, DCR, Department of Con Conservation and Recreation, both state agencies. So the city itself has essentially zero control um, on what happens on those streets and sidewalks. So is this the legislature? <coughs> is this the governor? This is, is this... Governor Baker and mm -hmm. his, uh, now acting secretary at Massachusetts Department of Transportation. And as you noted in your outset, there are plans. There are budgets and plans proposed um, to address, I wouldn't say solve, but address some of the most egregious safety issues. And it's not just safety, these crossings are ADA, are out of compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. You could not get onto the medians to cross these roads if you were using a wheelchair, there are no ramps. You would have to sit in the traffic. This is against the law. 
And so these roads are out of compliance. Uh, it was bad enough after one death, two deaths, three deaths that these weren't immediately fixed. But the plan was to go into construction next summer. And as you said, we suddenly found out that those plans have been put aside in favor of this steel, uh, extending the life of the steel project on the viaduct on I-93. Okay, so going back, so now what? I mean, what can citizens of Somerville do um, to, you know, to to address this? I mean, you know, how do we, how how do people communicate with Baker at all about, um, you know, about making changes and addressing this? Yeah. Well, first of all, I wanted to say uh, we there was a great rally this week. People came out, our state delegation, our mayor, our city councilors, uh, our, our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley were all there to voice our outrage at this long standing injustice for these communities in Somerville. What people can do is they can write, right? They can write to the governor, they can write to their legislatures. In this case, our state delegation is very supportive of both the work that WIG has been doing and the street safety improvements. And there are also two public meetings coming up that it's really important for people to turn out to. So the first is on June 1st, and this is a, um, a meeting where MassDOT talks about its capital improvement plan. And as WIG said, these large sums of money are allocated at the regional level, and this is where they make decisions about how to allocate that. And the second is a public meeting about this fast track viaduct project, and that's on June 8th. And if, um, if people who are listening are interested in finding out, it's a long link on, on MassDOT's website, but if you email streets at gmail.com, all one word, streets at gmail.com, we can make sure that you have the information for those meetings so that you can show up and make a public comment about it. And Wig, I don't know if you want to say more about how to get involved. Well, I think that the fact that it doesn't cost a billion dollars to create safe streets is an advantage. There's really very little excuse for not doing things sooner rather than later that are not that expensive in the scheme of things. You, you know, with the Green Line, I went to 250 half-day meetings at the MPO <laughs> over a 10-year period. And a lot of other people did an awful lot of uh, work as well. And we had three meetings where we put over 300 people in, in hearings, including the night the Red Sox won the World Series in 1986. People skipped that game to go to the last of those three meetings. But um, that was a lot of money for a four square mile city that they didn't really want to give to us. And, and so it took a, took a huge, long effort. Um, I, I but, but there's no excuse on this. Right. I think it's important to say that when all of this was happening in the 70s, Somerville was a, a poor community. It didn't have a lot of money. It didn't have a lot of clout. It's never had much of a tax base. Um, and so I, I would love to get your reaction on this. If Somerville is successful about that, do you think it's because Somerville's economic position has been changing, you know, basically since the red line came through? I mean, West Somerville, you know, it's East Somerville is still the poor area. And this is- I guess where these roads run. Yeah. This is a poor community. This is our environmental justice community. And that is, I believe, a large part of the reason why it continues to be ignored. Sorry. Yeah. So there there's no question, there's a high degree of overlap between environmental justice communities and large infrastructure projects and large amounts of local pollution that, that serve the big cities around them. Um, you know, if an immigrant comes here without a car, they're gonna need to carpool. You know, if they need to get to a job at Logan or the hospital district at six or seven in the morning, and or if they're cleaning offices at night and they need to get home, um, they're going to be carpooling or they're going to be taking public transit and the transit is is in line with the highways. Um, so there's definitely an issue there. Um, with regard to Somerville's current status, we are next to the two cities which have the, which have the greatest excess of jobs relative to residents. So Boston and Cambridge are short housing for 750,000 people relative to their workforces. 
And, and so that puts enormous housing price pressure on Somerville and, and other neighbors, but mostly Somerville, which shares the longest boundary with Cambridge, which, which is the most efficient in housing relative to its job force. Now, it contributes greatly to the economy, yeah. but see, so our we, economy we is research-based now. Sorry, Wig, we only have, we have less than a minute left. <laughs> so there's so much yet to say. Um, you've got those two organizations that, um, you know, that people can go to. Um, and, you know, I mean, I guess I just want to close out, but I mean, we're, you know, we are out of time. So I just wanted to thank both of you for sharing this information. Um, for people who live in West Somerville, maybe you're not as closest to this, these are our fellow citizens. Um, and it affects all of us. It affects the economic development of the city. It affects all of our air and pollution. It affects our, you know, ability to get to Assembly Square. It affects all of us. Um, so, you know, once again, thank you very much for doing this. And we'll be back in uh, two weeks with our next edition of Somerville Wire. Thank you for watching. Thank you.